Welcome back, everybody. This is the coolest panel. This is Where Are the Women? A Look at Industries, Sports, Tech, Media, and Beyond. We are joined by Evie Pampouras, former, former Secret Service Special Agent. Thank you. Maureen Sullivan, President, AOL.com and Lifestyle Brands. Simona De, De Silvestro, race car driver, Sauber Formula One team. And Justine Atel, Head of Cyber Risk at Dow Jones. Please join me in welcoming them. Hey everyone, how's everyone doing? Happy rainy Thursday. There's no place we all would rather be than here. No, and I'm not. with uh, a power group of women, like so many women in this room and who have graced this stage today. But probably, I was super excited about today and we've been corresponding leading up to today, just probably one of the most um, diverse and interesting group of backgrounds represented in these three ladies. Um, kind of not your normal, panel speaker um, from, from my vantage point. So, you know, our goal is really to have a conversation and a dialogue around the role of women in different industries and look across some of the industries that these women represent and, and look at some of the stereotypes that we think that are holding back women leaders. And also, on a more positive note, you know, how are these individuals breaking ground in their industry and what lessons do they have for all of us and I think a broader population around what we can do. So I'll start with Simona, who as you guys heard is uh, an amazing groundbreaker, world-class Formula One racer, mm -hmm. which I think we all probably just want to hear your life <laughs> Thank story. You. Thank you. If that isn't kick-ass, I don't know what is. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, to get, we don't know your industry very well, at least I don't and I would assume Maybe we do have some Formula One racing buffs here in the audience. Who knows, who knows? Uh, but I think fascinating, an industry that we don't normally talk about. Um, you know, where do you feel like your, your industry stands today around the role of women being recognized as leaders and not a novelty for being a groundbreaker, but a recognized you know, leader and, and groundbreaker in, in your sport? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing, uh, racing is one of the only sports where actually uh, men and women comp compete against each other, which uh, doesn't happen. Uh, head to that, head. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it is, uh, you, you're really trying to beat the guys. You know, I, pretty much throughout my career, until I got to a high level like IndyCars, I never really raced against another woman. Like, it's always been guys, until uh, I raced against Danica Patrick, which I'm sure you guys uh, are pretty familiar, um, in, um, in 2010 and 2011. And now uh, I'm trying to go into Formula One, which Formula One is the highest level you can get to in racing. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a global sport. It races all over the world. And uh, a woman hasn't competed in Formula One since like 1976. Wow. Uh, and there has been no woman who has been actually competitive uh, in, in this type of thing. So right now, I started my affiliation with Cyber Formula One team, done a lot of testing, and uh, things are moving along really well to be in the seat next year. So it's, uh, it's really exciting. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm really lucky to, to be doing this and, and, and to be involved in this, yeah. So we have to know what drove you to this, <laughs> no pun intended. Well, but where, yeah, where did this journey start for you? Um, definitely, I was more playing with cars than dolls <laughs> when, I was, <laughs> when I was a kid. But, uh, you know, my dad had a... Um, he had a, a garage, and uh, I was always around cars, and he used to say I was only quiet as a baby when Formula One was on TV. So I think <laughs> I had the racing bug pretty early, and uh, uh, I think the lucky thing is that like my parents saw that, that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, when I was five, my dad got me my first go-kart, um, and I was so passionate about it. And, and you know, it's definitely not a sport like every girl is gonna get into, but uh, the people around me really saw that that's what I wanted to do, and, and they gave me the opportunity to do it. And I think that's really what is important, uh, especially for young girls, you know, who are even, I'm really involved with like STEM education or, or the clean energy campaign that I'm involved in, and to go to schools and see young girls being like into engineering and things like that. I think it's really important to, to really support them to, to achieve their dream, to be working in the, those fields. So that's I nice. think that's pretty cool, yeah. That's awesome. And it's actually a good transition to another topic we wanted to talk about, which is this idea that it has to start at the youngest ages. You know, I think we're all really cognizant of the issues that we're all facing at the point in our career or industry that we are today, but I think we all know to really solve this for the next generation 
we have to look you know, to, to the next generation and the children that we're raising and our schools and what's happening. So you know, in your case, it was an, a combination of exposure, really important, but then the confidence, a group of people telling you, you can do it. You can yeah, do exactly. it. And I think, exactly. you know, uh, Makers, which is a, a platform that I represent and AOL is, is a part of, you know, is really about you have to see it to be it. You know, you can talk about it, but if we don't showcase these stories, you know, our vision is to be the largest collection of women's stories, not just because we like women's stories, because we fundamentally feel like the better job that we do as women in telling our own story, you know, that's really what inspires the next generation. But, you know, Justine, I know you've done a ton of work around Girls Who Code and STEM, and you know, what, are, what are your thoughts on how do we do this better? We all talk about this, but what are the real keys to having an impact? In technology in particular, there are a, hardly any role models out there for young girls who aspire to enter that field. And um, I was joking with some colleagues yesterday, actually, that there's only so many of us who can act as these role models. And so, you know, what if we just started faking them? I believe Hollywood is here. Um, you know, having role models in, on, on the big screen and in the media, I think, is going to be an essential ingredient for young girls and, in particular, encouraging them to get into the STEM field. Uh, computer science, for example. There's not a lot of opportunity in the school system for kids in general mm -hmm. to learn computer science these days. Yeah. There are not enough computer science teachers out there. Yeah. Um, but on top of that, for the girls, there are not these role models out there. So, you know, the reality is a lot of boys start learning to code in the basement um, whilst the girls are out there excelling at school, being perfect, and learning to be perfect and across the field, they're preening, they're looking beautiful, and they're doing great in school, but it's not serving them well in the future. They're not getting into, into the STEM fields, they're not getting into computer science. So the more opportunities we can give them in terms of education and role models, uh, the better at the, you know, as early an age as possible. And you know, it's a follow-up question, because I think as a parent, I think about this a lot. How much of it is a responsibility of the parent and you know, like that's your job, right? right. Like how much of it is? Well, I've been one school? homeschool. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we've we've taken that. Can my daughter go to your homeschool? <laughs> we could team up on that. Yeah. That, would, that would help both of us. But out. I think that's probably the balance that a lot of us are figuring out. There's the there's a corporate responsibility. Many corporations, I think, are focused on this and realizing when they yeah. do have leaders, someone like Justine and their organization, who's a you know groundbreaking technologist in a leadership role, how do they amplify that and give back? It's so important. And then I think schools are all trying to figure this out, but they have a million challenges around improving education. And there's so education. many stereotypes yeah. as well, especially in technology. Yeah. I mean, there's a, um, there's a poster actually that makes me really angry, and it's an Amazon um, web series called Betas. And the poster is these four boys sitting there at what looks like a bar with <laughs> laptops in front of them coding. And literally, the one girl on the screen is like leaning over the boys, like the girlfriend, like this totally <laughs> stereotype. I'm just, it just makes me really mad, you yeah. know. I, I, this is on a bus shelter today yes. <laughs> in this city. Yeah. Um, we've got a really long way to go when it comes to role models and how we portray technology as a viable career for, for girls. Yeah. So, Evie, Evie, I keep, I'm wanting to say your name wrong, and you're so nice, you're not going to correct me. Uh, you are a pretty fascinating uh, character, and your incredible background is really phenomenal. Um, I feel like there should be a movie about you. <laughs> there is someone from Hollywood. You should make a movie about her background. Um, but I think, talk to us about the stereotypes that women do encounter. And I think those are universal across your field, right? Uh, where it's um, you know, often about looking the part. <laughs> versus, you know, substance, and, and I think, you know, um, it's something everyone encounters at some point in their professional life. Um, you know, what, what have you been your personal experiences with that, and, and what are your thoughts? There are a lot of stereotypes. I mean, I was a, a Secret Service agent for nearly 13 years, and I served under three presidents, and I did undercover and search warrants, arrest warrants. I, I did all of that. And when I would walk into a room, I'd be like, oh, you? <laughs> you know, or I remember once I was on assignment in Africa, and I was actually the lead agent running the thing. And there were counterparts there who thought I was staff. They're like, oh, no, the staff and the interns are in the, the other division. And so I remember saying, well, actually, no, I'm in charge of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I love that. Nice. <laughs> He had a moment. Yeah. 
and he recovered. But of course, I maintained my professionalism, and I think that was that's really the key that when you endure these stereo stereotypes, which you will, and I did repeatedly, and still do, even though I've even transitioned into career in media because I discuss security and investigative analysis and I do that on air. When I walk in, people kind of look at me like, oh, you're gonna talk about that? <laughs> you know, it's usually the stereotypical male with the, the dark gray suit, the crew cut, and the, that military look that comes in and, oh, he must know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're gonna deal with that. I dealt with it. You accept it. You know that it's gonna happen. But I think what separates us and what makes you better is the way you react to it. And what I learned is I didn't react to it. You know, I maintained my professionalism, I maintained my class, and rather than demand respect, I commanded it in the way I carried myself and the way I did my job mm. and fulfilled my duties and my missions. And I think sometimes, yes, words are powerful, but I think your actions are what really you know, command respect. That's when people do respect you, when you show them, or yeah. when you shut them up, really. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. That's the quote of the day. Is command. It? Command yeah, respect. Command it versus having to demand it. That's awesome. So talk to us about, you know, I think for each of you, uh, you represent industries where there aren't a lot of other women. But what is, I think that's kind of an anomaly in some ways. And I think sometimes we don't do a good enough job as women, not this group of people who have shown up today for this event, but I think supporting other women, right, within our field. So do you guys have um, particular examples or anecdotes of times where you feel like you really got great support from another woman that was fueling you on your path and, and or, or maybe not. And is there, what lessons have you learned through that? I've got, I've got, a point, I've got an observation here. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of good examples yeah. of um, women role models for myself. Yeah. Um, I do encourage my peers in industry um, and those women who I work with to help think about the challenges that we face so that we can help the, the generation behind us. And something that somebody said to me recently was, you know, I've had to fight really hard to get into the old boys club because the old boys club is where the work is these days currently until we change it <laughs> in technology anyway. And it's, um, there's a no re-entry policy. So if I cross that line with my peers where they become a little bit um, disconcerted perhaps or unhappy with something I'm talking about with regards to women in technology, there's a very real chance that I'll be kicked out of that old boys club and I'm not getting back in again. Mm. So I, you know, and this, this woman said to me, I just feel like my hands are a bit tied in terms of getting involved. Uh, so I think there is that, that cautionary um, approach out there for a lot of my peers in technology. Yeah. Um, and it is a really delicate issue. Um, I've talked to a number of my male peers and they, everybody has a really strong and different perspective on these issues. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think a lot of the women in technology are treading pretty carefully. So um, we, we definitely, I definitely give thanks to the likes of Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer. And, um, I think that these women are really um, opening doors for a lot, of, a lot of us out there in the trenches <laughs> to, um, to, to, to feel brave enough to be able to start talking about it. It's interesting. Kind of unwilling advocates, right? Well, yeah. I mean, Potential I'm willing, advocates. Um, yeah. but I wish that there were more of us. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, a t like a, a tenacious, you know. Yeah, it a, takes a certain amount of courage. It really yeah. does. Interesting. Simona. Yeah, you know, I think in, in, in racing, like, um, like actually this year, uh, being with Sauber Formula One, uh, my team boss is actually a woman, and she was uh, the first one who's done it, like, four years ago. So uh, it's really interesting to, um, you know, because you, I'm always used to be around the guys, yeah. you know, it's, it is right. what it is. And, um, and for sure, you know, you, you try to do something that hasn't been done, uh, but then, you, you also feel like from the other women that they're, you know, because everybody wants to go ahead, you know, there isn't really that thing forming to help each other, you, know, you know, so I think in, uh, especially in sports, you know, because I think sports is so, uh, even like the pressure as an athlete that you have where you kind of pushed around and what you have to represent, you know, you have to look a certain way or things like that. So yeah. those are always really tricky things. And, and for me in my career, uh, I've never wanted to do that. Like I've always wanted to be like the person that you know is good at what I do, and and that's how I wanted to get the respect. And it is maybe the more difficult way to do it, but uh, 
I think that's what's really important because like I always say, at the end of the day for me, when I wear the helmet, I look exactly like the guys. I yes. just gotta do the job in the car. And, and you know, those are, are things that you get pressure from that because it's not something that you usually do. And, uh, uh, but you know, I think things are, times are changing and, and, and I think you know, where I am right now, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing, but for sure, you know, there's a lot, a lot of challenges that always come yeah. with it, for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you're an example, obviously there's competition in what you do, it's a fiercely competitive sport, yeah. you know, whether woman or man, yeah, it is, you, you know, need to beat the competition. Exactly, it, especially Formula One, you know, there's only 22 seats. Yeah. And I think every race car driver on the planet wants to go yeah. to Formula One. And, and when I look even, you know, a lot of people always ask me, oh, why isn't there more girls racing? Yeah. But when I look at go-karting, where we all start, there's maybe 200 guys go-karting, yeah. maybe five girls. Yeah. And just, you know, to get to a level like Indy cars, like, like the, the levels are just really difficult, but uh, you know, we really need to encourage if somebody is good at what they do to really try to help them as much as they can to, to get there. And uh, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to do. But yeah, the ratio is definitely really yeah. just not even close to, so yeah, competitive. so it is. It so is. the challenge for us is really to get more girls into go-karting. <laughs> well, yeah, in general. No, I wouldn't say that's our goal. Challenge, like if right? everybody wants to be racing, but yeah. I think in general, like uh, racing is, you know, everybody thinks it's just driving, but it's not. Yeah. Like Formula One is really technology driven. You know, the, yeah. the cars are, uh, even like this year, the cars are really hybrid. There's a lot of engineering going on. Like if I wouldn't be winning races just because I'm great at driving. Like yeah. I really need the team behind me. And actually there's more and more women uh, involved actually like at McLaren, uh, some of the lead engineer uh, is a woman uh -huh. uh, also like in endurance races. So it's really cool to see that. And, uh, and you know, to show that actually they, we, we can do the job as good or even better than the guys. So. It's yeah. fascinating because I think in your industry, competition is so natural and accepted because it's what you do. But I think part of the parallel is that we all have competition in our industries exactly. or even within our own work environments. And so I think that's where it starts to get sticky is that everyone is competitive. But I think sometimes with women, it, it feels like a zero sum game. And I think that's the problem, right? And is we that have such high profiles as well when you're one of the few women in the field. Yeah. Yeah. You, so you, you do sort of walk around with a spotlight on you anyway. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in my industry, actually, there's like one million job vacancies. So cybersecurity, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> a million job vacancies worldwide right now. So not so competitive. Like yeah, <laughs> not, not, not 22 yeah. <laughs> spots. <laughs> so I think, you know, for each of you, and I'd love you guys each to take a stab at this, so go in whatever order, whoever wants to jump in first. You know, in your career trajectory, can you think of like a one defining moment that kind of, you know, solidified for you, you know, I, I want to break ground in this industry, you know, or maybe it was a challenge or something. Like, what was that moment that, because obviously you are all groundbreakers in your own right, you know, um, wh what was that and how did that, you know, fuel you forward? I think for me, when I first joined the service, I was in the NYPD prior to that, and I'd gone through their training and understood what it meant to do the physical component and the mental psychological breakdown that they push on you. And then when I went to the, the federal government, to the service, my first week, I mean, I had qualified like everybody else. I completed the standards, and it was a very lengthy, um, hard hiring process that you have to endure. And unfortunately, not a lot of women endure it or pass. But I had reached that point, and I remember in training, I want to say it was like my second or third day, I was approached and told that I was not wanted there. And that because I was a woman, Without them saying it was a woman, really, but it was like, look, you know, they feel, some people feel that you don't have the mental and physical endurance to do this job. And I was confused. I was like, well, I, I did everything I was told to do. I, I passed all the same tests. I, I competed on the physical level like everybody else. I'm like, I, nobody handed this to me. And it was like, well, the physical standards for women and men are not the same. And that is true. The physical standards for women were brought to a lower threshold so that women could pass. Mm. That's what I was told. So that night I went to my room and I was very angry. I was angry, I was mad, I was sad, I was, I was everything. And there was a part of me that wanted to leave and be like, you know what, forget this. I don't need these people or I don't want this place and I'm just gonna head back home to New York City. But then there's this other part of me, this venom, so to speak, <laughs> And this thing that took over, and I was just like, no, I'm staying. I was like, I will prove them wrong. And, <laughs> and I got angry, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to qualify at the male standard. Forget these female standards. 
and that's what I did. So I found out what the male standards were as, for, were as far as you know, push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, all that fun stuff, right? And I was just like, well, I'm gonna do what the guys have to do. And that's what I did, and I trained morning and night, I mean, to the ground. I found the biggest guy in my class who was a former Army Ranger, and I came up to him, I'm like, you, come here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're going to be my combat partner for when we do tactics, and you're gonna train with me. And he understood, and he was like, no problem. And he was my partner. Wow. And let me tell you, like my back hurt, my body hurt. Like by the end of the thing, I would have to flip him over. And he was like two and a half times my size. But that's what I did. And that was a defining moment for me where I could have just been weak, I guess, and let the exterior and all these other things push me down and flee, because sometimes we want to flee. Or I could just say, no, I'm gonna stay, and I don't care if I fall on my face, I don't care if people laugh at me, I'm gonna do this. And I did it, and in the end, I did better than, on the physical standard than some of the men. Hmm. You know, and I learned that some of the people, and this is the interesting thing, I earned the respect of my peers, but then there are sometimes people that no matter what you do, yeah. no matter how much you excel, they won't respect you, or they still won't give you the props you deserve. And that's when I learned to differentiate the difference between the opinions of people who matter and people who don't. Mm -hmm. And there's some people you just have to be like, they don't matter. Yeah, that's great. How about you, Justin? So I was going along in my career and I was doing well and I was CEO of a small company and um, had my technical chops and knew who I was. And I was at an industry conference and I was walking the vendor floor and someone came over to me and um, just walked up and said, why are you here? And this was a, a, a security conference. And it, I just was taken aback and what, you know, whose girlfriend are you? Why are you here? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, at that point I actually pulled out my business card and it turns out the guy was interviewing with my company needless to say he never got the job. <laughs> 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 um, but that really just gave me, just that small, just that small little Gosh. moment in time was when I realized I need to do more than just do my job yeah. in this industry. I need to also think about the generation of women behind me and how that, it's just really not okay. And it'll, I'm as guilty as anyone at, you know, having some fun with the boys and I've grown up in this male-centric environment right. and, you know, I don't necessarily want everything to change, yeah. but um, I know that I do have to do what I can to make it more, a more accessible career for women. And it was that point in time um, that will always stick in my head is when I was like, I've got to do more than just my job. Right. Yeah, yeah for me, you know, it's like, I, I've always known that I wanted to be a race car driver and always people come to me and be like, oh, you know, it hasn't been done, like in Formula One, like physically, I don't know if you can do it or anything like that. But I think if you really want to do it, and you know, like you just, like for me, I know what I have to work on to make it happen because that's really what I want to do. And, uh, uh, and, and that's also, I think, the, like kind of the role I want to put out there, that if, if, you, if you want this and work really hard at it, that you, you can achieve it, whatever it is. Uh, and I think that's what's really important to understand and not just because, yeah, I'm a girl, want to be a race car, which is not really normal, uh, but that's what I love to do. You know, I couldn't see anything other to do, and so I work really hard to try to achieve that, and, uh, and I think that's kind of what people have to think about. Like, you know, if you want something, try to do it, yeah. it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So as you all look ahead to kind of the next 50 years of the women's movement, right? Let's say we're, we're 50 years into the modern American women's movement. And obviously there's the global women's movement that I think is in different phases in different parts of the world. You know, this is a, a little bit tougher of a question, but you know, I guess what keeps you up at night? You know, what, what, what do you feel like we're gonna get there in the next 50 years? Like I can feel it, I can feel it when I go to events like this and I, you know, all the positive work that you all are doing as leaders in your respective industry, you know, what, what, what's the good? But then also what, what's the thing that you're most worried about, you know, given all of your experience and being that groundbreaker? Do you have perspective on, on the hopes and good things that can come from the next 50 years of, of the women's movement and, and where you think we may be off track? For me, I want women to be braver and bolder. Mm -hmm. I feel that a lot of it is, is us. Mm -hmm. I know we focus on the external and those things do exist, but sometimes when I speak with women and they'll look at me like, how did you do it? And I'm like, well, you can do it too. Yeah. 
anybody can do it so long as you want to do it, like Simone has said. Like, if that's what you want, then do it. And I feel that women don't think that they should be brave or bold or courageous. Those words are more synonymous mm -hmm. when you think of men. Yeah. You know, women aren't taught to be daring. Like, there's this beautiful box, and we should just kind of look nice and pretty and fit in that box. And it's like, no, I want to be outside the box. I want to color outside the lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope for. I want women to do that. So for me, it's not about fixing what's outside of us. I feel it's about fixing what's inside of us. And when you fix that and that's powerful and you're centered, it doesn't matter what comes at you. All the other things will have a ripple effect and they will, I genuinely believe, like they will line up. I think it's a great point and I think sometimes when we have groundbreakers like you three, you know, we often sometimes put people on a pedestal and then we put them on the pedestal and then we'd love to knock them off once they're there too, you know? Yeah. So it's this kind of this, this We put them on a pedestal in a box. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice Color outside Which the lines, don't be in a box, but then fitness. once you get there, I think that's, the, that's where we do have a lot of those groundbreakers, but you see this vicious cycle of, you know, we sometimes yeah. turn that into a bad thing somehow, right. you know? And I think that's the, that's the inner reflection that you know, all of us, you know, women especially, need to. I think to focus labels, on. stereotypes, yeah. boxes, men versus women, yeah. the definition of gender, um, alienation of certain part, you know, men, alienation of men yeah. from the feminist movement or whatever we want to call yeah. equal opportunity for everybody. Yeah. Um, I think that so, you know, just stereotypes and labels and traditional traditional societal models being applied to the modern world is what keeps me awake at night. Yeah. I think that we're, the whole world is changing. And just us continuing to get stuck in that trap. Yeah. Despite as things yeah. move on, the, the, the yeah. stereotypes and the labels continue to yeah. Yeah. pigeonhole us. Yes. Simone, any thoughts? Yeah, well, yeah, that's the biggest thing. I think if you, I think and the word is like being gutsy a little bit. You know, I think guys, like if they want something, they just do it and go for it. Where I think, uh, like even me sometimes, I think about, oh, you know, is that really the way to do it? Like sometimes I overthink things, yeah. but uh, I think that's what's important. Like just, you know, like what you want to do with your life and just kind of go for it, you know? It. And, and for sure it's not going to be easy. Like if I look at my career, like it's not been great like all the time, but you know, I've always had this goal and like I've been working for it since I'm five years old. I'm really lucky because I knew I was wanted to do it since I was really young. And um, But, you know, it wasn't easy, but now things are actually starting. Like even if I look at the industry, actually, you know, I'm really considered to to potentially be the first one who drives a Formula One car. Like, if you thought about that five years ago, it would have been like, no way, nobody can do it. But all the steps that I had to go through are kind of leading to that, and it's, and, and you feel it around you, you know, it's starting to change, and I think that's just, you know, kind of believe in yourself and, and go for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I think yeah. to bounce off of that, I think sometimes as women, we feel like we have to ask permission for the yeah. things we do. Mm -hmm. Like, is it okay to do this? And we almost look for somebody else to give us the Okay, the, the blessing. Yeah, yeah, you can do this. It, yeah. And like when I started off doing what I was doing, my girlfriends all looked at me like I was crazy. You want to do what? <laughs> you know, and even my, and I love my family, but when I joined the New York City Police Department, my mother cried. <laughs> Before, she didn't speak to me the whole time I was in the academy. She was so mad. And you know, I'm first generation Greek. She's like, why you do this? <laughs> I don't understand. All your friends, they I swear, they it's a movie. Your life's a movie. <laughs> we need to go, we need to make that movie. So She's watch like, it. why you don't be normal girl? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and if I sought that permission and if I, I waited for that okay, I would have never done anything I wanted to do, mm -hmm. ever. So a lot of it is just knowing what you want and then just going. And then people, I mean, for every, you know, yes, you're here, you're going to hear 20, 20 times as many no's. No, you can't this, no, you mm -hmm. can't that. And you just got to like, okay, that's great, thank you. Just stay focused yeah. and go. Tunnel vision. Yeah. And then, you know, just like you said, like you just do what you want to do and you don't let other people deter you. Stand in your way. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think we're, we're tight. We're at the end, if you can believe it. Um, obviously, you know, highlight for me to spend time with you three. I think I, hopefully, you guys all feel the same way I do, that amazing to hear the insight and, you know, just kick ass, all of you, what you're doing in your respective industry. Thank you um, on behalf of women everywhere. And we're going to close. Yeah, let's give them all a round of applause.
and we're going to close with a short little video I mentioned Makers, which is you know aiming to be the largest collection of women's stories ever assembled. In this fall on PBS, we did a uh, documentary film that aired last year. If you haven't seen it, please see it. You can see it on Makers.com. But a really attempt to chronicle the last 50 years of the modern American um, women's movement. But there were way too many stories to cram into a three-hour documentary, so we've actually created six more documentary films looking at women as groundbreakers in different industries. So this is a little sneak preview of what's coming this fall on PBS, and hopefully uh, you guys will all tune in. Uh, and now I'm realizing that we have to do more documentaries <laughs> on women in racing and women in the Secret Service, but uh, our work will never be done, that's for sure. So thanks, you guys, for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you.